With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. I'm Fahima Mohammed, who will be presenting tonight, a relationship and couples coach as well. And I want to warm welcome all of you here on, from British Muslim TV who are watching and streaming from wherever you are around the globe, or if you're streaming from Sky Channel 752, or whether it's on Facebook or Twitter, a very, very warm welcome tonight. I'm really loving the topics that we are all having, and that's because you are sharing your thoughts, whether it's via the WhatsApp messages or on the platforms that you're commenting on, and we really do appreciate your support. You can participate in tonight's show and join in the conversation and discussion with myself and my guest, as we are gonna be discussing another amazing topic with a really, really special guest tonight, all the way from the United States. And if you want to participate, you can do so by calling in on 01924231083. And uh, standard uh, national rates do apply. So please make sure that you do ask the bill payers permission before calling in. If you want to also message us and you can do so anonymously and for free, you can do so on the WhatsApp um, call and that can be uh, dialed or messaged for free on 07585835150. And those numbers will remain for the rest of the episode for tonight. So make sure that you take your time, get your questions ready, and inshallah, we will be looking forward to hearing from some of you tonight. But as we go in today, I really want to introduce my guest, who is all the way from LA and uh, originally from the UK, but now living in sunny USA. We have Layla Naji. Salaamu alaikum, Layla. Alaikum assalam. How are you? Thank you so much for having me on this evening. I'm very well and even more excited to have you tonight, Leila. I've been looking forward to your talk and our discussion. I know how experienced you are, and this is a really, really great topic. We are going to be discussing about how to overcome and deal with rejection. Now, this is something that we can either play down, but I know that there's some deep rooted um, sort of impact and responses that individuals have when it comes to especially relationships. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in depth. But before we do, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, Leila? Absolutely. So um, as you said, my name is Leila Naji and I work as a life coach and I do counseling. I also do um, education and training for parents in positive disciplining. And also I am a psychology professor at a local university here. So definitely my interests are to do with people, helping them navigate through life and helping to normalize the conversation around mental health and mental health struggles, especially within the Muslim community, because I think we are making strides and we're moving forward and we're creating more acceptance, but there are definitely some topics that are still difficult. So it's wonderful to be able to provide guidance and also have an understanding of the cultural limitations and challenges that people experience uh, when you know they are having mental health challenges. So hopefully we can, shows like yours are so groundbreaking and they're doing such amazing things to support people and guide people and let them have conversations that otherwise they would not have an outlet for. Thank you so much. That's amazing. I love all the work that you do. And mashallah, how amazing are you um, also being a professor at one of the universities there? So you are streaming from um, the USA and um, it's absolutely uh, wonderful to have, you know, all of your you know, knowledge and education background as well. Um, could you firstly describe for us, because, you know, we talk about these kinds of terminologies a lot of the time, but I want to be absolutely clear. And there are psychological um, sort of like, you know, terminologies technologies, which we may not even really understand. So when it comes to rejection, we think we understand, we think we know, but could you maybe define it so that we have more clarity on that? 
Absolutely. So rejection, like many other terms, it can take many forms and it can be something extremely mild that we're able to brush off. And then it can also be something extremely impactful that actually lasts for potentially your whole lifetime. And so generally rejection is when something happens that doesn't go our way something that we are hoping for or expecting to happen and it doesn't happen in the way that we're hoping for and we don't generally have any backup plan or we don't have the skills and the resources to really cope with what it feels like to be rejected. This can be something extremely minor such as you see someone you know walking down the street, you say hello and they perhaps don't notice you, you know, you wave and they don't wave back and even something as small as that makes us feel a little bit awkward inside. And so taking it all the way to the other extreme, it would be rejection from family members, withholding love and so on. And so rejection is really when we don't feel accepted included when one of our expectations or our goals is left unmet at the hands of other people often and we can also experience self-rejection when we don't accept certain parts of ourselves too so we will be elaborating and going into more detail and giving more examples of rejection but in a nutshell that sort of encompasses some of the aspects of it That's very well explained, and I think it's really vital, actually. It's crucial that we do understand and have a real um, in-depth analysis about rejection, because there you've already just described so many different ways that we can be rejected, which I didn't even think of, especially when it comes to, you know, us rejecting the way in which we are and the way in which we expect and accept ourselves. And I think that alone is really, really important to discuss further. Do you think that comes from our upbringing, our experience? experiences, our past, you know, because at the end of the day, when we look at someone else, which we will go into when they reject us, that's one way. And then how we respond is another. But then if we have self-acceptance, self-confidence, self-esteem, does that make a difference? What's your opinion on that? It absolutely makes a difference, but unfortunately, it's one of those things that is one of the most difficult to achieve. And Family is, it does play a huge role. And I know sometimes people look at it as if we're blaming the family or blaming the parents as it were, but it isn't just family. It's really everybody in your environment that's around you from your school friends to your work colleagues, to society in general and the media and the messages that are being placed around us. As human beings, we really are like sponges and we tend to absorb everything that's going on around us. So in childhood, from a very young age, the way that we are spoken to, the way that our family interacts with each other and with us, really creates the type of inner dialogue that we will have with ourselves. There's a quote that is a favorite of mine that says, the way we speak to our children becomes their inner voice. And that is really so true because they are getting their impression of themselves at a young age from us, from our approval, from being praised, from being criticized, from being punished, from being um, encouraged. And so depending on how those around us are responding to us, you can even go back as far as infancy and look at were a child's needs met in infancy, for example, if a child is in distress or crying, did they get picked up and comforted? Or did parents adopt a different method? You know, often people adopt the cry it out method, um, which works for some families. And obviously, it's one of those controversial things that people have opinions on. But the way that your needs are responded to really helps you to form an identity as to who you are in the world, whether you're valued or not, whether you have a support system around you, whether you have to rely completely on yourself, and the way that others view you becomes internalized, and it becomes the way that you view yourself. So the biggest thing that we can conquer is honestly, if we're able to work from the inside out and create that self-acceptance and value our own selves and recognize how much we have to offer 
the world and those around us, it will make the external interactions that we have with people a lot less painful and a lot less impactful. And we'll be able to let them bounce off of us instead of absorbing them and internalizing them and using them as a way to sort of confirm our already insecure or negative beliefs about ourselves. So I would say, obviously, people around us, people within our different environments are extremely important. But the number one goal would be to reach that self-acceptance, to acknowledge our own valuable qualities and what we have to offer ourselves and to offer those around us. And if we can have a solid foundation of that, then working on external things that we cannot control will be a lot easier. Those are such amazing, interesting points, Leila. I, I love everything that you've said, and it's really, really uh, blown my mind away and given me so much more food for thought as well. Um, when it comes to us growing up um, into young adults and we're looking for relationships, and I know you've said that our past does play a role, our parenting, but then at one point we can say if our parents did pick us up, you know, when, is that what we expect from a relationship all the time? And sometimes if there was a little bit of tough love, then maybe we could actually handle a bit of rejection. So when it comes to relationships, because this is what the show is all about, it's understanding how to have better relationships and addressing all the challenges and the issues that are around it. And when it comes to relationships, then we are definitely going to be talking more about how we are affected when we are rejected, when we are trying to pursue relationships. Um, we are going to be coming towards a break shortly, but I do have so much more. And you've given us an amazing introduction into this topic already. I cannot believe that we are actually only just started and I've got amazing questions for you. And if anybody else wants to speak to Layla tonight, please do so. She's an extremely um, amazing, talented, very, very well educated and experienced you know, whether it's a professor, life coach, counselor, mentor, you name it, she has all those skills and we are really fortunate to have her just for tonight. So make sure you take advantage by calling in or even sending through your messages. I would love to read them out. And as she has highlighted so far that when we're talking about rejection, we are definitely going to address this more when it comes to relationships. But I hope that you stay exactly where you are. Stay tuned. And inshallah, we will be back where Leila will be enlightening us with more information around this issue and topic. And hopefully we will see you shortly. And make sure you stay put and comfortable. And we will see you in a few moments. Salaamu Alaikum. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV sponsored by singlemuslim.com. We're having an amazing discussion with my guest tonight, Leila, all the way from LA. And she has already opened up so much chat with regards to rejection. And we haven't even started with the main topic yet with regards to rejection when it comes to relationships. We've highlighted a little bit when it comes to where it may stem from, when it comes to our upbringing, our families, how we were you know, brought up you know, by our parents, our environment. And that is an you know, extremely good point to start from. Leila, when it comes to rejection in relationships, firstly, do you think that because it's usually the male gender that usually comes forward, especially in our communities, they're constantly putting themselves out there to actually maybe get a number, speak to a girl, or even if it's for real proposals and things like that. And do you think they can handle rejection better than us women? Or do you think it's kind of equal? What's your opinion on that? So what I think actually is, and I'm going to sort of take us 
many, many years back and talk a little bit our, of, on our evolutionary history and how rejection actually stems from that period and why it affects all of us equally as human beings. And so initially back in the days when we were sort of in tribes and had to hunt and gather our food and so on, um, we were very community minded. And the way that people understood that rejection was a painful thing is that when people would behave in ways that did not benefit the group or do things that sort of stepped outside of the group's norms, they would be ostracized or they would be mistreated and the sense of not belonging, which is a very innate need to us as human beings, would feel so bad that people would quickly change whatever the undesirable behavior was in order to be accepted back into the group. Because even if they had to go against what felt natural or comfortable for them, it was more painful to be rejected rather than to lose your authentic self. And so that pain of rejection and that process in our minds that tells us we need to do whatever we can in order to feel accepted and to belong again goes all the way back to evolutionary times and to bring in a little bit of science now i'm not a scientist but i think that it's very important these days for us to acknowledge biology when it comes to mental health because there are actually many biological, physical factors that are occurring in the brain that contribute to some of what we feel. And studies have shown, you know, they've put people in MRIs and they've watched their brain react when they've asked people to recall painful memories of rejection. And they've asked people to recall painful memories of something that actually physically happened to them that was painful. And what we've learned is that the brain receptors which activate when you are in physical pain are the same ones that activate when you are experiencing the pain of rejection and emotional pain, which is really important because it highlights just how serious it is. And these days, you know, we do live in a society where often people are told to get over things or brush it off or someone else will come along. But I think realizing that there is something physically going on in the body and the brain is actually responding in the same way that it would to somebody being physically hurt, hopefully makes us take this topic and other mental health topics more seriously. So looking at it from that background, I would say that men are perhaps in our community in the sense of relationships more susceptible to being rejected because they are required to put themselves out there more but I think that it is actually more difficult for them to recover because they have to repeatedly put themselves at risk. So when you're initiating something in whether it's getting to know somebody or whether you're already in an established relationship and you're trying to initiate closeness or intimacy and you get rejected and it happens over and over again, it will impact you even more and it will make it more difficult for you to put yourself out there. So just because men have sort of traditionally been assigned the role to be the ones to go and initiate um, a friendship or a communication, it doesn't actually make it any easier for them to recover. And of course, because we have some reservations about male mental health and the fact that sort of men should toughen up, you know, unfortunately, even in 2020, we still do hear the phrase, suck it up, act like a man, you know, don't show your feelings. I actually think it's more difficult for them to recover from rejection and it can have longer standing effects than for women. I really am blown away by everything that you've said so far. And I love the fact that you brought in the science because I actually am studying the science of this and whatever you've said is 100% true. We are activated in our minds um, by, you know, rejection and things that are very painful. And I love the fact that you've actually highlighted as well that in our communities, we might brush this over when actually it can be quite detrimental and serious for certain individuals to deal with rejection, to actually have an impact, which is quite longstanding which can be quite detrimental if it's not seen to seriously and also for people around them to have that understanding the empathy and the support 
Um, on the other hand, you might find individuals who are constantly even, you know, um, maybe approaching maybe women when it comes to all men um, for, you know, courtship, for relationships, and they constantly reject it. That might actually even build them having a thicker skin and they might be okay with it. So there's different ways of looking at it as well. But I think what you highlighted is the majority of unfortunately what we do, we don't really like to have anyone say no to us. And the impact of that is very, very deep. Now, when somebody is being rejected, what would be the stages that they feel physically, emotionally, mentally, and what can they do to sort of like, you know, get themselves out of that so that it doesn't become so detrimental and hopefully they can move forward and they don't lose self-esteem, confidence and hope from actually being rejected. So I think going back to what you were just saying is that for some people, we see that it makes them want to retreat, want to give up, to no longer put themselves out there. And that can apply to everything, you know, from relationships to job interviews, to initiating friendships. If you perhaps move to a new area or something, you know, whatever it requires, putting yourself out there and making yourself vulnerable um, and, you know, having your behaviors outcome be at the hands of another person you know all of these types of things can make someone feel rejected but whether or not somebody develops a thicker skin as it were or whether or not it becomes detrimental to their mental health really depends on how they respond and what goes on internally in their mind when they experience this rejection and so what I'm going to speak about is the typical way that most people respond internally when they feel rejected and what is the alternative and the more healthy way and the practical things that we can do to lessen the impact of that rejection. So typically what we do when we are rejected, so for example, let's um, take the job interview example. If you go and apply for a job and you think that you have all the qualifications and the experience and then someone else gets chosen instead of you. So immediately, rather than us looking externally at the other circumstances that may have caused that person to get the job, that they may be a better fit for whatever reason, perhaps they live closer to the company, perhaps they have a few years more experience, whatever it might be that caused them to be chosen over you, we don't look at those things at all. Instead, we turn our gaze inward and we look at ourselves and we start to sort of do an appraisal of ourselves and an evaluation evaluation of ourselves and all of our insecurities get triggered and we start to find all of these deficiencies in ourselves in order to make this rejection make sense. So we start to sort of think that, well, I don't have enough experience. I should have done more internships or I should have worked more. Or I should have volunteered places or perhaps I should have a higher education. I should have specialized in this or I should have taken extra courses or maybe I didn't present myself well enough in the interview and maybe I wasn't talkative enough or maybe I interrupted too much. So essentially what we do is we start to criticize ourselves and blame ourselves for the outcome of putting ourselves out there. And the same exact thing happens in relationships when we approach somebody, if we're not a good fit and if we're not compatible and if it doesn't go in the direction that we want it to go, we don't tell ourselves that there's somebody that's going to be more compatible, that's going to come along, or that's going to be another option that in the long run will be better for us, or that perhaps you know there are other aspects such as that person is looking for certain things that we can't offer or um, perhaps even external things like geography and distance from family and all of these other aspects, um, family values and so on, that are external things that are not necessarily personally to do with us and they're not deficiencies. We don't look at those. Again, we turn inwards and we look at all of the things that we may have done wrong, all of the things that are discrepancies or shortcomings in our personality that has caused that person to reject us or not be interested in, in a relationship with us. And so that is sort of generally the default behavior that people go to when they experience rejection. They sit there in their mind and they go very much inward and they list all of these things about themselves that are not enough, not good enough, and the reasons that 
they were rejected and usually it brings up whatever insecurities that person has. We use that rejection to confirm those insecure beliefs or those negative beliefs that we have about ourselves. And so those people are the ones that will have more difficulty recovering, moving on and putting themselves out there again. An alternative to that of people who can be more resilient in the face of rejection would be people who stop in that moment and remind themselves that this isn't necessarily anything to do with me. There are all of these external factors that have contributed to this person either not hiring me for this job, not accepting, uh, you know, getting to know me for a relationship instead of turning in on ourselves. And what you can do in that moment when you're feeling vulnerable, when you're feeling insecure, when you're blaming yourself, is to stop and actually not accept and have a zero tolerance policy for that negative self-talk. In the same way that if you heard a friend of yours do it and say, well, he or she rejected me because I'm not good enough or my education isn't high enough or I don't get paid enough or my house isn't big enough or I don't have a home yet or what, I'm not good looking enough, whatever it might be. In the same way that you would stop and interrupt your friend in that train of thought, you need to be that intentional and stop and interrupt well, yourself. Well, as, as you are talking right now, I'm going to stop you right there only because I have got even more questions for you, Leila. And in Inshallah, we will only be addressing this after the break. And uh, you've given us so much already, but uh, we hopefully will catch that on the other side of the break. And we will see you in a few moments. Inshallah, make sure you stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. And we're here once again with Leila Naji for this episode, who is taking us through an amazing journey discussing rejection and so much tips already as to how we can understand it, how we can hopefully um, acknowledge what's happening with ourselves when we are feeling rejected, when we are rejected, and especially when it comes to a romantic sense. And I want to go back into that a little bit more deeper because it's not just about rejection when you're actually starting off you know trying to find a relationship there are even people that are in relationships and they are already married and they can be rejected whether it's emotional sexual intimately whatever that may be romantically while you're in that marriage now Leila can you explain a little bit more about that do you think that's easier or more difficult especially if it's consistent what's your thoughts on that I think it's definitely more difficult because obviously the stakes are higher and then when it's coming from somebody that you are in a relationship with, there are attachments and romantic feelings and so we definitely tend to be hit harder and we definitely take it more personally when it comes from somebody that we care about and we love and we want their approval and we want their acceptance so much. And there's definitely a difference between the occasional rejection and consistent rejection over time. And there's also a difference between rejection in certain, um, for example, requests to do a certain activity together or, or to a request for help with something in the home. So that's also different than sexual rejection. And a lot of it is really to do with how we present that rejection to somebody. So in relationships, there are four different ways that we can reject somebody. And this mainly focuses on sexual rejection, but I think it can apply to other areas of relationships. So the first one would be 
called reassuring rejection. And that is when if somebody, if your partner is making or initiating, you know, um, some intimacy or making some kind of advance to show that they desire to be close and intimate with you, a reassuring rejection would be acknowledging their attempt, reassuring them about how you feel about them, and then perhaps finding an alternative form of connection or physical contact that you will both feel satisfied with that doesn't necessarily need to result in actually having sexual relations, but it might be hand-holding, it might be cuddling. And so that's a reassuring rejection that doesn't leave the person feel that they've necessarily been rejected. It doesn't make them feel that there's a disconnect between the couple. And again, this can be used as a compromise in other areas if, for example, your significant other is very outdoorsy and adventurous and wants you to partake in a certain activity and it's really not your thing then you know finding a happy medium of well I'll come with you and I'll support you in doing that and I'll cheer you on in doing that but it's not really my thing or maybe just saying well I'll try it once just for you because it's important to you so a reassuring rejection doesn't actually affect the health of the relationship long term and it doesn't make the person who is initiating feel different or feel that there's something wrong with the relationship or that somehow there's something wrong with them. And so it, we're not saying that rejection should never happen. Of course, we can never accommodate somebody's, we can never always accommodate somebody's needs and some things may not be at a convenient time. And we also want to stress that everybody should have autonomy over their own bodies and only do things when they consent to doing things and they should never feel coerced or guilted into doing something. But if people use reassuring rejection, then it really won't feel like a rejection at all in the traditional sense that we think about it. The flip side of that is a hostile rejection. And a hostile rejection will really show somebody being frustrated, being irritated, and they may even criticize their partner for even suggesting such a thing or making such an attempt. And I believe when hostile rejections happen a lot in a relationship, it really is indicative of an underlying problem. The fact that you can't show compassion in that moment and the fact that it, you know, it becomes personal and that the partner does get criticized for initiating something, it really does show that there may be underlying issues or an inability to communicate or express certain things that needs to be worked on in a relationship. And that will have a lingering effect for a number of days. Um, the reassuring rejection, what we found that is the person who puts themselves out there, if they receive the reassuring rejection where they may not be able to um, have the intimacy that they want, but there's an alternative activity that can be shared, they don't lose their self-esteem. They still feel good about themselves and the relationship. And the person who is approached, the person who is the one who is being made, you know, advances towards also for up to th two or three days afterwards is on a little bit of a high because obviously they feel desired and loved and wanted by their partner. So the reassuring rejection really goes both ways in keeping both partners happy and um, reminding each other that they're on the same page and that, that both of their feelings matter. Whereas the hostile rejection is only going to create those seeds of doubt and feed into somebody's insecurities. And then for the person who is doing the rejection, it's again going to confirm any negative feelings that they have towards their partner. And it will fester and fester until it becomes a much bigger problem that's more difficult to overcome. Um, another approach is an assertive rejection, and that is one that isn't just rejection for the sake of it, but it actually gives a reason. It's firm, you know, it gives a reason as to why somebody can't engage in that behavior that is being requested at that time. Um, and it's very direct. So it doesn't, it doesn't become personal. It doesn't resort to criticisms or attacks and doesn't show dissatisfaction in the partner. It just may be a case of bad timing or that person may feel unwell or they may have another engagement or there is, you know, an actual reason, but it's very firm and assertive and, um, clearly outlines that this isn't an option at this moment in time, but perhaps later on. 
And then the last one is the deflecting rejection. And that is the one where people sort of don't even acknowledge that someone is making an attempt to connect, be it physically or emotionally or whatever it might be. And that could be things like pretending you don't hear someone, um, going and engaging yourself in another activity and, and leaving the room. It could be pretending to be asleep if someone is making sexual advances and just you know pretending that you don't even notice because you've, you're already asleep. And that is very confusing also because it's avoiding something and there's a reason obviously that you don't want to connect and you don't want to respond to someone's advances and avoiding it that way by pretending to be asleep or leaving the room just leads to a lot of unresolved issues that need to be communicated about later on. So those are the four different types of rejection and how they impact the outcome and how they affect the long-term health of a relationship. And that could be in friendships, it could be in the work environment, and it could, and it generally they're tailored and explained to be towards sexual rejection, but I can definitely see how they can fit into other areas of our lives. So I think remembering that it's okay for us to say no, we have the right over our own bodies, over our own time, if something is not the right time or for whatever reason we have, but doing it in a reassuring way and offering an alternative to where the person feels that they got a little bit of what they needed and you also feel that you were able to maintain your boundaries of what you can and can't do at that time. I absolutely love listening to you, Leila. I can honestly listen to you for another few hours because, you know, your information is so, so crucial. And the fact that it is psychologically based as well with these are from research and studies. And this is so important for relationships. And what you've highlighted is something that a lot of us are really not aware when it comes to relationships. We're not even aware of our own communications, the way in which we will actually address somebody and how it actually shows up. So for you highlighting those four different types, I think hopefully is a great takeaway for anyone who is either looking for a relationship or in a relationship, whether it's short term that they've just started or even in their long term marriage, it is absolutely crucial and vital. And you can definitely use this kind of information to assess yourself, to assess your situation. The thing is, when people are in especially the ones which are avoidance or the ones which are the negative side of things. Um, how would they actually address it? Like what would be the steps they could take to actually, you know, be better at it so that they can actually come out of the relationship, you know, dealing with that scenario a lot better, even if they're the ones that are actually initiating that rejection. Now, obviously, like you said before, it's a crucial underlying issue that's obviously raising that kind of negative response. So what would you advise um, and some of the guidelines you would give some of these people that are going through that sort of stage um, for their relationship to improve? So I think if we are looking at it from the perspective of the person that's doing the rejection, one of the most important things that we all have to have in order to improve ourselves or make any changes in the way we approach any aspect of our lives is to have a certain level of self-awareness. So it's really being very raw and very honest with ourselves at least, even if we can't be with another person yet, but really admitting to ourselves that this is how I handled it. You know, I did act in a way that was uh, hostile or I did act in a way that was avoidant. And usually that happens because that is a learned pattern of behavior where probably someone has grown up and seen their parents or other people in their family handle rejection that way, you know, avoiding conflicts or perhaps attacking and being hostile. And we learn along the way that when a situation arises, this is the way that we respond to it. The wonderful thing about that is that we can always relearn things. The brain can be retrained in the same way that we can learn physical skills and learn new talents. We can also rewire and reconfigure our brains so that they don't respond in that way. So I think the first step is having self-awareness and realizing that using these types of negative responses is going to have a long-term detrimental effect on the relationship and the bond between the two people. And then being very open and communicative and really just saying, I didn't handle that in the best way, or I wish that I had approached it in another way. I would like to try again. I would like you to give me another chance, or perhaps they can take the lead and then they can go and try and initiate something because it honestly is very vulnerable 
and very risky emotionally when you're the person initiating some type of connection. You know, you're really putting yourself out there and you're willing to take the risk of being rejected. And so one of the biggest gestures that you can do if if you are the person who engaged in the rejecting behavior, and especially if it was a negative one, is to put yourself in that person's that shoes. That is so true. I love that. that. And I really easy. think that we are going to continue with more of these tips that Layla has for us in a few moments after we have the last break of the episode. Do stay with us. We are going to continue in a short moment. So stay tuned. Inshallah, we'll see you soon. Assalamu alaikum. Take care. See you shortly. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the final part of Single Muslim Live for tonight. We're here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. And I want to thank all of you that are, you know, watching, tuning in from wherever you are, also leaving some of the messages that are on Facebook and Twitter. I really do appreciate the support, by the way. And it's absolutely amazing that you're here joining us live tonight. Um, again, Leila, thank you so much for all those tips that you've shared. I really have taken down so much notes. And honestly, you have really, really... Um, um, blown me away with everything that you've shared and it's so so important again that I have to obviously say this when it comes to relationships when it comes to rejection and you've really you know highlighted the really main important points um before we actually go into this a little bit more as to recovery and you know maybe normalizing how we actually accept um, rejection um how would you know a person sort of um you know have long-term effects and the impact of rejection and then from there tell us as to how we can maybe you know withstand that kind of uh, feeling and hopefully trying to give us some tips as to navigate around rejection so that we can actually manage it better and hopefully inshallah you know we won't actually have any more issues after listening to some of your guidance so one of the things that, one of the many ways that people can be affected by rejection depends on, first of all, the frequency of the rejection and the severity of the rejection. So obviously somebody, you know, asking a friend if they want to go and get a cup of coffee is not going to have the same impact as maybe proposing to someone and being rejected and it's not going to have the same impact as having consistent and long-term rejection of love or affection from family you know, beginning from childhood and onto adulthood. So depending on the severity and the, the duration of the rejection, um, sometimes just anxiety can be brought up in a person because obviously, you know, they're afraid of putting themselves out there. As we said a little while ago, the person who is initiating any kind of contact or any kind of uh, connection is putting themselves at risk emotionally. And so if they are repeatedly rejected, then that might cause fear and anxiety and, you know, uh, a hesitance or a resistance to wanting to do that again. If that happens continuously and if it happens in more dramatic ways in a person's life, such as being rejected by a parent, being rejected by a partner, then that may lead to more serious mental health issues such as depression, um, such as social anxiety. Um, it could also even be um, personality disorders that can develop, such as avoidant personality disorder or borderline personality disorder. And 
this is definitely in the more severe cases and the more long-term cases. And if some kind of um, rejection happens, such as by a parent or some a, a really close loved one, and it's happened in a very negative or a violent manner, that can also result in symptoms of post-traumatic stress and just experiencing trauma in general. So those are the potential side effects of rejection, depending on what type it is, in what arena in your life it is happening, who it's happening by, and how long it's happening for. And so what we also want to know is how to protect ourselves and how to recover from when we experience a type of rejection. So again, you know, we talked and touched a little bit at the beginning of the show on how we shouldn't turn inwards and we should look to externalize the problem. A lot of the time we take everything personally and we try to rationalize and reason as to why this has happened by looking at ourselves and looking at deficient defic excuse me, deficiencies within us or shortcomings, shortcomings that we might have. So what we can do, there is nothing wrong with evaluating the situation to see if you could handle it differently. It's okay to evaluate a job interview. It's okay to evaluate initiating a relationship or a friendship and sort of look at yourself and say, could I have done something differently to be more welcoming, to be more enthusiastic? Evaluating is actually a very healthy thing because we should always all be reflecting on our own behaviors and how we can be better communicators and so on. But evaluating is different to um, criticizing yourself and to pointing out all of the things that you think are negative or, or highlighting your insecurities. So the first thing would be to evaluate in an objective way as much as possible, stepping back from the situation and sort of looking at it and thinking, now, is that how I would want someone to have approached me? What could I have done differently? So that would be the first thing. The next thing, as I also mentioned earlier, is to have this zero tolerance policy of negative self-talk. So in the same way that you would stop a friend from sitting there listing all the things that are wrong with them and all the things that cause them to be rejected, to have that same zero tolerance policy with yourself. You wouldn't talk that way to another person. You wouldn't like them to talk that way about themselves. And so don't talk that way to yourself. The next thing would be to try and shift your perspective and to actually stop and very meaningfully and purposefully try to think of and even write down, because writing things down is really powerful, um, five things that you value about yourself, five things that you contribute to your friends, to your family, to your, to the world in general. Maybe you are a really good listener and maybe you are a really loyal friend and there may be so many different qualities about you that we don't even have to limit it to five. But I would say in that moment of rejection to try and think of at least five positive things that you really like about yourself, that you appreciate about yourself and your character, because it really balances those negative thoughts that try to creep in. And we can even take that a step further. And a lot of the time, sometimes when we're working with people who have low self-esteem, which again can be impacted by rejection, is we get them to engage with people whose opinion they care about, such as family members, a parent, a very close friend, and ask them to share, you know, three or four or five things that they appreciate about them or the ways that they enrich that person's life. And so um, that can definitely counteract the negative thinking and the criticism that generally is our go-to when we're being rejected. The other thing is that rejection, it really disrupts and destabilizes our sense of belonging as human beings. And that is one of our core needs as human beings. So I would say as soon as you possibly can, spend time and connect with people that you feel validated with, that you feel safe with, that you feel accepted by. That might be spending time with your family. That might be spending time with your friendship group. It might be spending time with um colleagues, if they are people who uplift you, if you are somebody who's into sports or activities, you might have a team that feels like a community. So I think connecting with people who make you feel valued, who you feel accepted by and, and uh, going to a place where you feel like you belong can really also disrupt those negative feelings that can be caused by rejection. And it really will turn it, minimize the experience, turn it on its head, and suddenly it isn't no, any longer this huge thing that defines you. It's just an event that happened in your life that you can move on from and you realize that you have all of these other things going for you and it stays an external event rather than something that is internalized and a reflection of you. 
Those are really great tips and really good guidance. I love everything that you said. And inshallah, a lot of people that are listening today will take away from that. I actually do have a question uh, that's come through at the last moment, actually, and hopefully we can get that uh, answered by yourself. Um, it says, how does the one who rejects the other get past their own ego to then apologize? So if there was a battle of egos, I'm assuming this is probably in a you know, a marriage relationship, because this is usually um, some sort of scenario that would be given in this sort of question. How would you respond to that, Leila? I would say that, first of all, I would acknowledge that it's definitely not an easy thing. But we have to look at the long term perspective and think that is this moment, you know, the thing that I really want to dig my heels in about? Is my pride strong enough to make me hold back and not try and fix this situation. You know, how much does this person matter to me? How much does this relationship matter to me? And sort of, is this the hill that I want to die on? You know, we always say, pick your battles. We can't always have, um, we can't always agree on things all the time. We can't always have our way all of the time. And the one of the inherent parts of a successful relationship is that, we throw around this word equal all of the time. And it's not really about equality because that can shift, but it's about making sure that people's needs are met. So one person might have a need at one time and they can, the other person can cater to them. And another time it can be the reverse, but it's not a competition about, we both need to get what we need at exactly the same time. So I think taking a, a sort of a longer term perspective thinking about all of the things that you love about this person, all of the positive traits that you have, they have, uh, all of the reasons that why you're with them in the first place, you know, will help you to feel more compassionate, remembering positive experiences that you've had together or things that they've done for you that have made you feel loved will really put you in that compassionate and sort of warm and fuzzy headspace that will help you to drop your guard down and also, you know, feel able to own up to that rejection and communicate in order to move past it. And another thing is remembering that if you are, you know, in a couple that has children, when we do these things, we're always modeling this behavior for the younger ones around us. And as we said at the beginning of the show, you know, children learn from observing how the family interacts with each other. And so when they see that we can resolve conflicts, when we can come to a happy medium and compromise, they are learning that and we're setting up a new healthier cycle for the next generation. That's beautiful. Everything you've said has been absolutely wonderful tonight. We have just under a minute to go. I want to give you this opportunity to say some final things before we actually end the episode, Leila. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. I do believe this is such an important topic and it's something that we all experience sometimes on a daily basis, but it might be minor. And we live in the world now where social media makes us very accessible to a much wider range of people. And so the potential to be rejected or mistreated, you know, unfortunately is uh, multiplied compared to how it was some years ago before social media existed. So people have access to us all the time. But in the same way that we say this and, and, and you know, there's a famous psychologist called Carl Young, who, Carl Rogers, excuse me, who uh, talks about unconditional love. And he talks about the fact that anxiety is a normal part of life. And one of the reasons that it causes us so much stress is because we're trying to resist it all of the time. Well, you know, Leila, you've given us already so much. And I know we could have gone on for another hour or two, but unfortunately we have come to the end of the show. I wanna thank you for your time, for all your knowledge all of your insights and thank you everyone for watching tonight it's been an absolute pleasure inshallah we will see you in another episode next week thank you for streaming in thank you for all your support for your messages and i really look forward to seeing you next week have a lovely evening thank you from british muslim tv and everyone here assalamu alaikum
3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live.